All right, well, the Young Turks, we got a great, great show ahead for you guys today. Um, we're going to do some fun things. Uh, we've got uh, Princess Boys in the second hour. That ought to be interesting. In the third hour, not only are we going to discuss the, uh, we're going to have one of the top experts in the country to tell us exactly what the upsides and downsides were of financial reform was, because I don't want to get anything wrong. I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and also, hey, look, if they didn't fix it, we'll find out, all right? And also in the third hour, Ben Mankiewicz joins us uh, for his top 11 movies of the year. And by the way, I totally disagree with him on many things, so that should be a fun conversation. All right, uh, and in this hour, uh, we are, it's a momentous day, actually. We're going to lift our ban on Ann Coulter. Now, uh, I've resisted this for uh, years now, and I will explain why, well, I'll tell you right now uh, why we're lifting it. Uh, she made a specific comment about me. So I'm going to have to answer that. Uh, that's coming up a little later in the program. Okay. Uh, but let's get started. Uh, lots of huge news for you guys today. First of all, um, I've been saying for a long time that I believe the country is actually very progressive. Now, I don't say that because I view myself as a progressive, so I wish the rest of the country was like uh, me and had the same priorities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, I say that because... I have read the polls. Now, the poll that everybody will throw out there instantly when you start talking about this is the poll that they took where they said, uh, oh, what do you call yourself, conservative, moderate, uh, liberal? And liberal came in last out of those three options because liberal's been made a dirty word for 20, 30 years. And people will be like, oh, liberal, no good, liberal, 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 right? And then, of course, by the end, if you've called something poo enough, people think it's poo. So they go, oh, I'm not a liberal, no, no, no. And you will see every hack on television use that same exact poll. Whenever this issue comes up, okay? Now, why do I think they're hacks? Why do I think that doesn't make any sense? Because if you actually ask the American people on issue by issue, they are massively progressive. They, they might not call themselves liberal, they might call themselves progressives or moderate or independent, whatever you want to call them, but look at the issues. So, a poll came out today that absolutely confirms that. 60 Minutes Vanity Fair poll asked, how would you like to balance the budget? Coming in at an overwhelming number one, raise taxes on the rich. 61%. Did they stutter? That is the American people saying, look, if you want to balance the budget, that's priority number one. Priority number two, as you can see on the screen there, is cutting defense spending. And that came in at 20%. So how much more progressive can they be? Well, they said, well, how about uh, Medicare and Social Security? Should we cut those? Only 4% thought we should cut Medicare, and only 3% thought we should cut Social Security to balance the budget. And guess what they're looking to do right now in Washington? Cut Social Security and Medicare to balance the budget. <laughs> Washington doesn't give a damn, man. You can come up with 28 polls like that. You remember the polls on the public option? 70%, 60%, 80% in favor. Who cares? That, no. Hey, who's at fault for uh, this great economic crash? Wall Street. Uh, in poll after poll. Hey, who, what's the number one problem in the country? Uh, the fact that our politicians are bought. Campaign contributions. Citizens United by the Supreme Court was reviled, not just by liberals or progressives or moderates or independents. Republicans hated that. Republican voters hated it. What well, was the number one issue when it came to uh, Republicans doing polling on their own people? Offshoring of jobs, totally ignored. Every one of these where the polls come in and agree with the progressive position, they are totally ignored. Instead, in Washington, you will hear, this will never get mentioned again, this poll, uh, unless I somehow miraculously keep talking about it enough that it starts to get into other people's consciousness. No one else is talking about this, right? And they will forget about it tomorrow, and uh, tomorrow when you see someone on television, they'll say, oh, no, 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 the only way to cut is cutting Social Security and Medicare. Uh, no, that's the only way to go. That's what the Republicans will say, and then the Democrats will eventually back them up and say, well, what could we do? That was our only option. As you can see, the American people think you have many other options, options they would much rather have you do. Do we live in a democracy, damn it, or don't we? When you see something like that and you see how Washington reacts to it, you begin to think that, as a lot of us already suspect, that we don't run the country. 
The corporations run the country. The rich and the powerful run the country. Whoever buys the politicians, they run the country. But you see that poll? That's what real Americans think. By the way, you don't have to wait till uh, tomorrow or, or, or the day after. <laughs> Lindsey Graham was already at it uh, during the weekend before the poll came out. And look, I'm just going to give it to you as an example. I mean, you can see a million examples of this in the past, and you'll see a million examples of this in the future. Let's go to clip number four. He's on Meet the Press, I believe, and we're going to find out uh, which programs he thinks should be cut to balance the budget. How will you vote on the debt ceiling? Will you vote to raise it, which is a, which is a vote that will come up in relatively short order? Right. Well, to not raise the debt ceiling could uh, be a default of the United States on bond uh, and treasury obligations. That would be very bad for, for the position of the United States uh, in the world at large. But this is an opportunity to make sure the government is changing its spending ways. I will not vote for the debt ceiling increase until I see a plan in place that will deal with our long-term debt obligations, starting with Social Security, a real bipartisan effort to make sure that Social Security stays solvent, adjusting the age, looking at means test for benefits. On the spending side, I'm not going to vote for a debt ceiling increase unless we go back to 2008 spending levels, cutting discretionary spending. All right, I but let me stop you for a second, Senator. That's a big condition yeah. just on Social Security alone. Yeah. Do you think Republicans it are is. prepared to follow you in two things you said, raise the retirement age and means test benefits for older Americans? I would suggest that if we're serious about taking America in a new direction and you're not putting entitlement reform on the table, you've missed a great opportunity to change the course of America's future. And the last election was about change, change that really will make us something other than Greece. A great opportunity to change entitlement reform. I will remind you every time, the reason they're called entitlements is because you paid into them your entire life. That's why you are entitled to Social Security and Medicare. It's your money. And what does Lindsey Graham see that as? A great opportunity to rob you of it. He says, no, no, no. Oh, we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna raise the debt ceiling, we're gonna cut uh, anything. First thing to be cut is your Social Security. Now, remember, when they raise your re retirement age to 69, not only do you have to work an extra two or four years, but they don't give you the benefits for those two or four years. That's a massive cut in your Social Security and eventually your Medicare. They're coming for it, man. And I'll tell you what, man, we got to do a long-term fight because in the short term there ain't a damn thing we can do about it. It's a steamroller. They're not going to give a damn about that poll. And the Democrats aren't going to be with you. I had Ed Rindell on, on the Ed Show. Uh, last week, Ed Rendell is supposed to be a tough progressive fighter. What did he say? Oh, no, no. No, we got to raise the retirement age. No, no, no. We got to cut Social Security. That if you want to be realistic, this is a great opportunity to cut Social Security. Hey, hey you had this opportunity to raise taxes on, not even raise taxes on the rich, bring the taxes on the rich to where they were before the disastrous cuts that Bush put into place that uh, destroyed our economy. And well, apparently, Lindsey Graham and the Democrats didn't think that was a great opportunity. Now, you see I'm a little uh, discouraged, and you see that I'm getting the feeling that uh, this White House might not fight for you. Now, that's partly because they've already put together a deficit commission, which, by the way, Robert Reich had a terrific article on today, where he explained uh, the deficit commission proposed $3 of spending cuts for every $1 of tax increase in order to balance the budget. And by the way, that tax increase, Reich doesn't talk about, but I've uh, done the analysis on it before, is, and it's anybody can do the analysis, it's super simple. It is largely a tax increase on the middle class. <laughs> that deficit commission actually cuts taxes for the richest people in America. It is grotesque. It's grotesque. <laughs> They're coming for the middle class. This is absolutely, positively class warfare. They're coming for your piggy bank. They're coming for your retirement account. It's as clear as day. They say it to you every single day. Republicans say it and Democrats say it. Three dollars in spending cuts for every dollar in tax increase, and that tax increase is overwhelmingly on you and not the rich. The deficit commission cut on not just the highest income bracket, but the corporations, etc., was insanity. And everybody in Washington loves the deficit commission, even though you all despise it. All right, and I'm not talking about progressives watching the show. Look at it. All Americans, they don't want that. God, I mean, imagine you're a guy who's 
work to you're 61 years old, 65 years old, whatever, however old you are, damn it, 48 years old, 23 years old, whatever, we have all paid into Social Security and Medicare for so damn long. Now they're going to go ahead and take it from us. All right. Now, why am I discouraged today in terms of the Obama administration? Well, we have news out that uh, President Obama is considering a new chief of staff. Now, uh, we had long complained about Rahm Emanuel. Uh, he appeared to be one of the more right-wing elements inside the White House, and he continually, literally, insulted uh, progressives and called them effing retarded. And he got in trouble for that <laughs> from Sarah Palin, not because he insulted liberals. Everybody in Washington loves when you insult liberals. No, but he used the R word, which she shouldn't have used. But in every conceivable way, Rahm Emanuel blocked progressive goals and said, no, 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 we need to compromise, we need to go more towards the Republicans. So just when you thought he couldn't get any worse, well, the interim chief of staff is Peter Rouse, and he is possibly more pro-establishment than Rahm Emanuel is. He's worked in the Senate forever in the past, and he used to be the chief of staff for Tom Daschle, okay, who's now a gigantic lobbyist on the Democratic side, right? But okay, hey, Peter Rouse, at least so far what I'd seen, I kept a very open mind, and I didn't see him actively pushing right-wing agenda, so I was like, oh, I, I don't know, maybe, hope against hope, he'll be better than Rahm Emanuel. Well, it turns out they're probably not going to go with Rouse. Uh, he's, I, I, I don't know why. Uh, people say he wants to retire. They're going to go with someone else. The rumor or the news report out, however you want to characterize it, because it's not definitive, is that they're going to go with William Daly. If you thought Rahm Emanuel and Peter Rouse were in favor of the establishment and, and were right-wing, Wait till you get a load of William Daly. First of all, William Daly thought that the health insurance reform that was passed was overreaching. He thought that they, we did too much health care reform. We should have done less. Financial reform, oh, he hated it. He, he thought it was way overreaching. That joke of financial reform that almost did nothing to the banks and let them keep doing everything they were already doing, he thought it was too much. Now, what he wanted was to kill the Consumer Protection Agency. The one thing that happened right in that bill, he's like, oh, he was outraged by it. Do you know, you want to know why? Because he works for J.P. Morgan. Not only does he work for J.P. Morgan, he was on the, uh, he was the co-chair from 2005 to 2007 of the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce is now an unbelievably right-wing organization. They're the ones that spent over $70 million to defeat Democrats. Almost all of it going to Republicans in the last election. And William Daly was a co-chair of the Chamber of Commerce's Commission on the Regulation of Capital Markets in the 21st Century. You know what they were in favor of? Deregulation. They want to deregulate the derivatives market. <laughs> As the derivatives market was crashing from 2005 to 2007, causing an economic collapse uh, unseen in our lifetime, William Daly was at the Chamber of Commerce and at J.P. Morgan pushing to deregulate the derivatives market. You cannot pick anyone worse. Maybe Bob Rubin. Maybe you bring Larry Summers back. Just when you have any degree of hope that Obama would ever go in the right direction, he goes, no, wait till you see me go even further in the wrong direction. If you're still not convinced, get a load of William Daly's quote here. He said, the election of 08 sent a message that after 30 years of center-right governing, we had moved to center left, not left. Now he said that in the context of health care reform, saying, oh, we're not center left, hell no. I mean, we're not left, we're barely center left, maybe, 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 and this health care reform is too much. No, it's too much. No. <laughs> so the 08 election, Obama saw, uh, it, it wrongly, according to William Daly, as asking for too much change and being too progressive. He says, no, we need to head more back towards, uh, it would be this way, the right way. <laughs> if this report is true and Obama picks William Daly, I will pound the gavel. There's no hope. He will forever go right wing. He will forever go establishment. And we, uh, you know, despite all that I have pointed out to you and all the things that Obama has done that are so incredibly pro-establishment, I am still stupid and naive and hopeful enough to have just a wee bit of hope that he would go in the right direction. But if he picks William Daly, no, that's him saying, no, 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 screw all of you. Uh, by the way, you know what the report says as to why uh, they think he might they go with Daly? 
because he likes his expertise as a manager and his close ties to Wall Street. And he views that, views that as an asset, asset that might be too valuable to let go. His close ties to Wall Street that you're going to pick as your chief of staff. And then manager, we had to bail out JP Morgan. We, these guys were part of the system that crashed their economy. What value do they have at JP Morgan as managers? We live in an upside down world where right is wrong and wrong is right. And, and, and if they pick William Daly, I, look, there's not a conversation. Just give up 100%, 128%. Obama's never going to do the right thing if he picks Daly. And then, of course, when we point that out and say he's as right-wing, pro-Wall Street, a so-called Democrat as you could possibly find, they will say, oh, you're being sanctimonious. You're whining. We are giving you a tiny little bit of change. We have given you 3% change, and you still complain. All right, now, because this is directly relevant to whether I have this thing assessed correctly or not, because honestly, I ask myself every day. I, I mean, look, I, I'm, and you see me struggling with it every day. You know, I, I'm not one of these people who think I'm 100% right about everything and I'm never going to change my mind. I change my mind all the time. And I consistently, every single day, look at the facts and say, all right, do I have it right? Because I don't want to be right on this, right? We work so hard to get a Democrat in, as a president. And what happened? Apparently not much. All right, so. To that point, have I been right about some things? Now, do you guys remember, and I'm looking here at JR and Jesus here, who I said would be a real threat to the president and why they moved him, uh, I don't know if you will, it's a small thing, and why they moved him out of the country and why they made, put him as part of the Republican, uh, Obama administration, I should say. Interesting Freudian slip. Remember, I said it was John Huntsman, governor of Utah. I said, here's a guy who is actually, you know, not moderate, he's conservative, right? But he understands the, the faults of the Republican Party, and this guy could be a real threat. And right at the beginning, Obama, I thought, sensed that and picked him to be his ambassador to China, even though he's the Republican governor of Utah. Now, uh, there's a report out John Huntsman might be running for president in 2012 anyway. And the reason that Obama had picked him to go become the ambassador of China is because Rahm Emanuel and the Obama administration thought that John Huntsman was the single most viable candidate on the Republican side, which is exactly what I said at the very beginning of the Obama administration. Look, we might be wrong. Obama might be wrong on that. I might be wrong on that. But I think Huntsman is a, is a fascinating guy. I think he would be a real threat. And if he came back and ran in 2012, it would be interesting. He'd probably lose. 2012 is too early for him, okay, because the Republican Party is way too right-wing, way too irrational. Maybe he runs in 2016 and he's a hell of a candidate. I don't know, okay. I think he's probably a little too early now. But to give you a sense of, at least when I read that, I was like, okay, I'm not crazy. My political instincts are right. I'm seeing it uh, in a way that is how things are actually unfolding. Now, to that point, in May 1st of 2009, uh, President Obama was going to pick uh, his first uh, nominee to the Supreme Court. And I went over a list of um, uh, the top candidates along with Ben, right? And at the time, Sonia Sotomayor was the top candidate, but I had a dark horse that I thought he was going to pick instead. Uh, and we had a little discussion about that. First, let me set it up for you guys. We found it, the guy who found it, by the way, is Edwin uh, Umana. He is a great intern here. And I was talking about it on air, and he went and found the old clip. And so here's the beginning of that conversation from May of 2009, right in the beginning of the Obama administration. I am going to be brash again and predict Souter's replacement. No, oh, nice, all right. This'll okay, this will be fun. So now this is not nearly as clear, uh, and there are a number of possibilities. All right, so I laid it out as there's a number of possibilities, and I went through Sonia Sotomayor and some of the others. I said it's not clear, right? But I said I'm going to go for an underdog here. And honestly, I had Edwin look into it because I didn't remember who I picked. Jair and I had this discussion, and I, was, and I kept thinking like, hey, did I, did I get that in any way right? And I remember because it, of course, he picked Sotomayor, and I did not say Sotomayor in that clip. So I came out after Sotomayor was picked on this show, and I said, hey, look, I was wrong. I guess I didn't get it right. I, you know, I, My political instincts weren't right. So let's find out who I said was going to get picked by Obama. All right, here, here's my pick, Elena King. 
Hmm, that's interesting. Did she wind up getting picked, JR? Oh, right, that was the second person who got picked, isn't it? So, look, again, this is not to say, oh, my God, I'm the best, I got it right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's to say, look, sometimes I do get it wrong, and a lot of times I get the timing wrong, right? Remember I said Rahm Emanuel was going to step down, and I got the timing wrong by about two or three months, right? I had put an unnecessary timeline on it, and then it turned out a couple of months later he actually resigned, right? <laughs> and so I get the timing on it wrong all the time, right? But I can see why they're going in that direction. So when I tell you Obama is going to the right if he picks William Daly, please trust me. I'm not saying it as a matter of braggadocio. I'm telling you because it's a warning. By the way, let's just quickly look at the reasons that I thought they were going to pick Elena Kagan. And they were almost exactly why they picked Elena Kagan as the second nominee to the Supreme Court. Let's watch that clip. Uh, the upset uh, pick here. Now, I have several reasons for that. One, uh, she's already been confirmed as the Solicitor General. So she's made it past confirmation. That makes it easier. That makes it safer. Mm -hmm. uh, she is um, someone uh, that, you know who picked her for the head of Harvard Dean, uh, Harvard, Dean of Harvard Law School? Who's that? Larry Summers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so already trusted people within the administration have picked mm -hmm. her. Right. Although that's going to turn off uh, progressives. Yes, and she, but this is why another reason why they might pick her, because she's already turned off progressives by arguing that battlefield rules for detention, including indefinite detention, should apply outside of the battlefield. So if you take a Taliban guy and you put him in the Philippines, that's still, in her opinion, considered technically the battlefield, which a lot of progressives would disagree with. A lot of uh, conservatives get a hard on over. So uh, they, it might seem like a moderate pick. Oh, I gotta be honest with you, man. And they went with Sotomayor the first time, and the second time around, they picked her for exactly those reasons. She was establishment. They could uh, say she was moderate because she is moderate, and uh, they loved that she agreed with the Republicans on that, on those issues. They loved that she pissed off progressives. They were like, "Oh, pissed off progressives, <laughs> welcome." So Elena Kagan is now on the Supreme Court. Now, if I'm right about Daly, or not me, but if these reports are right about Daly, cold dre, old Turk is saying, close the book, drink a cold glass of water. The whole Obama administration is done. All right, now when we come back, just when you think the Democrats are bad, the Republicans find a way to be much worse. God help us all. All right, come right back. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, great hour ahead for you guys, including uh, a Navy video that has gotten uh, some folks in trouble. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting case. And I think we might have some controversial opinions on that. Okay? Yeah, I, I agree. All right, but before we do that, just two quick notes, uh, and maybe I'll bring this back in the context of that case in a second too. But, but first, on the EPA story that I just did, um, you know, I talked about a 101-page memo saying why the bees are dying. It's because of a pesticide. It's clear. It's systemic. Please stop it. Uh, how do we find out about that EPA memo? It was leaked. Why do you think they hate the leaks? Mm -hmm. Because the leaks actually tell us what our government is up to. That's why the government despises the leaks. So without the leaks, we'd have almost no journalism in the country. All right, and uh, speaking of which, uh, The Guardian has been printing a lot of the leaks, whether it's WikiLeaks or otherwise. Uh, and Shavala Medlena actually sent me a note for, uh, yesterday after having watched our segment on DynCorp. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we did the story about, about Shabazi, the, how the American contractor who used American taxpayer to buy underage boy prostitutes for their Afghan recruits. Mm -hmm which is so sickening and revolting a story. I, I don't, I, if that doesn't grab headlines, we'll, we'll, you know, everybody on YouTube is saying, Jake, you're such a sucker, you're so naive, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't grab headlines because that's the way the corporate media is set up to ignore this car, to stop, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, so the, what Sh Shavala sent me was uh, DynCorp, and, and it's my bad that I didn't know this before, had gotten into trouble for almost exactly the same thing. Back in 2007. No, no, back in 2001 to in Bosnia. Oh, oh okay. I, I'm sorry, not in 2001, 1999, I should say. Sorry. Uh, when we, back when we were in Bosnia, uh -huh. um, they were, their contractors, this time not to get recruits for themselves, 
were buying girls, not just for prostitution, they were buying them. They would own them as basically slaves. As young as 12 to 15 years old, mm -hmm. there was a 400 pound man who would brag about how he had a 14 year old girl uh, that he had oh. bought. There was another man who, said, who was uh, 65 years old and said, oh, my girl can't be a day over 12. And he was bragging to, and they would bring them to work. A, a guy from Texas, six five, uh, you, you know, six foot five guy, Johnston, goes there, good guy, decent guy. I don't know a thing about his politics, but he's like, Jesus Christ! I mean, this is, this is the den of in, iniquity. I mean, if, if you want to talk about immorality, this is it, right? He turns them into uh, DynCorp. DynCorp says, "Get out of here, man. Uh, we don't want to hear that garbage." He so he has no choice. He turns them into the military. Dyncor fires Johnston first. They say, uh, yeah, bad employee, got to get rid of a couple of bad apples. He doesn't know what he's talking about. They get an 18-year-old who had also participated in this to write a report saying it was all him. That he had, not that he had done the prostitution, because obviously he didn't, mm -hmm. although actually they smeared him on that later. They said, oh, he was trying to get acquire weapons or something. Uh, yet, DynCorp continues to get massive billions of dollars worth of contracts from the United States government. How many times do they have to have sex with underage boys and girls throughout the world for us not to give them contracts anymore? Our government is monumentally corrupt. Monumentally. By the way, DynCorp, of course, unsurprisingly, would not... I see here, I'm doing the whole story. Okay, I, I can't. I can't help it. Unsurprisingly, uh, they would uh, not fix the things, the planes that they were hired to fix, because the longer they took, mm -hmm. or the more parts they needed, the more they got paid. Right? So they would drag their heels. Sometimes they would break things so they could fix them. Okay. It, it, sometimes they would hide parts that the military needed. Mm -hmm. And why? Because all to make more money. Now, what happens if you hire people who are not accountable? And by the way, you know what happened back in 1999? They said, oh, no, we can't prosecute. The military said, we can't prosecute these guys. They're not held to Bosnian law, and they're not held to U.S. law. Mm -hmm. Now, where have we heard that before? Iraq, Afghanistan. So these contractors are above the law. If you put people that are above the law, and then you also say, uh, oh, by the way, you get paid money for doing this job badly, they will do the job badly, they'll get overpaid, and they will apparently rape young boys and girls. Oh, by the way, the head of DynCorp in that division in Bosnia uh, admitted that he raped one of the girls. Uh, but don't worry, he was eventually, begrudgingly, fired. Was there any criminal charges? Oh, of course not. Raping underage girls, that's totally fine if you're an American mercenary. And how maddening is it that the majority of our federal money goes to defense spending so we can pay private contractors like this. That's what irritates me when it comes to taxes. Okay, if our tax money went to really good causes like 9-11 first responders, think about that real quick. Six billion dollars, all the drama surrounding the six billion dollars to ensure 9-11 first responders. People were against that. But on the other hand, how much are we spending on DynCor? And, and their immoral practices? We're spending two billion dollars a week in Afghanistan alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, two billion a week. So much of it going to defense contractors that are totally unaccountable and apparently getting underage boys to prostitute themselves to older Afghan men uh, who are police that we're training. What are we training them in, right? This is the Afghanistan war for you. They get rich off of it. We get killed in it. It is uh, the machine that has been built. It is grotesque. And, uh, and, and you've heard all about this, right? Except other than this show and a couple other shows, you haven't heard a thing about it, right? Huh, weird how that happens. Very, very strange. All right, now let's go on to good things in the world that we're trying to create. Uh, we do have good news, uh, so let's go turn to that. All right, I wanted to give you guys a quick update on our auction. In fact, the auction is now over. I have the winners of the auction. We have the winners. Now, remember, this auction was... Uh, we were doing it for charity water. Yes. Uh, we're trying to build uh, wells throughout the world so that people can get clean uh, drinking water. Uh, we were trying to build one well uh, and that we needed to raise $5,000 for it. Uh, it turns out so far we have raised uh, over 13000 so we're onto the third well. Woo. <laughs> honestly, the TYT Army is even stronger than we suspected. It, yes. I, I honestly one, didn't, yeah. I didn't think it was going to be that much. And, those, and those wells provide clean water for 
20 years for that community, for those now apparently three different communities that we're going to be able to build wells for. Hey, look, we're trying, man. We're trying a little bit. And then Steve's daughter, uh, Allie, had done some paintings, mm -hmm. and we decided it'd be cute to auction them off for charity water. Yes. And the auction happened over the weekend, and the results are... All right. So the highest bidder for one of the paintings uh, was Regressive Party Champlin. Uh, he or she, I'm not exactly sure, uh, sure. D donated $150 for one of the drawings. So uh, I will mail you that drawing. All you have to do at this point is go to Revision 3 slash Charity Water, look for the Young Turks logo, click on that, and donate the $150, and we'll mail over uh, the, the drawing for you. And also, Steve-O uh, decided that he wants to buy a TYT hoodie or a TYT shirt for the highest bidders. So I will also email you and ask you whether or not you want a hoodie or a shirt or what you're into. Um, so the second highest bidder was uh, Roland. Yoshinaga, and uh, he donated $250 uh, for a single drawing. So wow. we're going to mail him a drawing as well, along with a TYT hoodie or shirt. And then uh, the third bidder is Pergo. Uh, that's his handle. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it. But uh, he bid $200 for the abstract drawing. All right. So those are the three different uh, paintings, uh, pictures in a row. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, you guys are awesome, unbelievable. Allie is through the roof. She's decided she's going to become an artist. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, they're ecstatic. You know, Steve told the story that his kids, uh, who are incredibly young, you know, uh, three daughters, all, all under the age of nine, uh, said, don't get us Christmas presents, uh, donate to Charity Water instead, which is very heartwarming. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I'm glad we've done a little bit of good in the world. At least we can go to our grave saying, hey, at least people got some drinking water, you know. It's a good start, man. We're going to build on it. What we're actually going to do, of course, in the long run is challenge the system and change the system. We're going to try. We're going to try our best so that we can get rid of the problems we mentioned in the first story, right? Uh, but this is an excellent first step, and the TYT Army has been phenomenal on this. So once we get to 15,000, that's three wells, and that'll be great. All right, now uh, the stories of the day. All right, I have a supplies video for, for Jake. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, actually, JR found a great viral video on YouTube, but I want to share it with you guys. It's a homeless man in Columbus, Ohio, and he is known as a homeless man with the golden voice. So let's watch the video. There are often homeless people asking for change and freeway exit ramps, but recently there's been this guy with an interesting sign at I-71 and Hudson Street. His handwritten sign says he has the God-given gift of a great voice. Hey, I'm going to make you work for your dollar. Say something with that great radio voice. When you're listening to nothing but the best of oldies, you're listening to Magic 98.9. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. And we'll be back with more right after these words. <laughs> And don't forget, tomorrow morning is your chance to win a pair of tickets to see this man live in concert. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, when I was 14 years old, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. When I was 14, I kind of listened to one of our area radio announcers. And uh, I went as a field trip to go meet the guy, and he looked nothing like what he sounded like. So I asked him about that, and he said to me, listen, radio is defined theater of mind. And so when he said theater of mind, I just said, well, hey, I can't be an actor. I can't be an on-air personality. But the voice just became something of, uh, of a development over years, and I went to school for it. And then alcohol and drugs and a few other things became a part of my life. And I got two years clean, and I'm trying hard to get it back. And hopefully somebody from one of these television or radio says, hey, I need a voiceover, or I, I need something. So, you know, I'm hoping one day... Watch Family Guy, weeknights at 7.30 on Fox 28. I'll tell you what, man. He's good. He's you, really good. You were right about those sophisticated homeless people in San Francisco. I think he's from San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. I think that he messed up by saying he's from Columbus, Ohio. No way. He's from <laughs> San Francisco. Wait, was it story? Is he in uh, San Francisco now? Is he originally no. from Columbus? Oh, no, it's in Columbus. Oh, okay. I thought you said San Francisco. Okay, because we had had this debate earlier about sophisticated uh, homeless in San Francisco. I never Francisco. said sophisticated. She said they dress in tuxedos no, and recite poetry on every street corner. Anyway, uh, he's awesome. 
He is. He's so good. And, you know, JR said that um, he's really rooting for this guy, and I am as well. I was reading the comment section on that video, and a lot of people submitted that video to the Howard Stern Show right. and other shows that might pick him up. And, you know, I'm rooting for him as well. I mean, you know. Seriously? Sometimes we need voiceovers. <laughs> he's pretty good. <laughs> okay. I don't know how we get in touch with him, uh, but we got his name. Ted Williams. In Columbus. Dude, it's already going to be too late. Well, first of all, I, this is my prediction. He's going to get. He's going to get his chance again. Because as he said, you know, he, he fell off with whatever addictions he had. But um, he, we're not going to be able to afford this guy. By next, <laughs> by next month, he's going to come on. So we're going to be like, oh, do you, do you, oh, yeah, we put this video. Hey, can we, can we, we, we remember you. Can we get some voice work? Oh, yeah, that's six figures, son. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be making more than us uh, very, very soon. <laughs> yeah, that would be funny. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, I'm already employed, and I'm going to need you to piss off. How perfect is his voice? His voice is just, it's golden. <laughs> but, you know, last thing is that mm -hmm. I, I liked it, what he did. Look, he's got a talent. Mm -hmm. He advertised it, okay? And he gets more money that way, and maybe even a job offer in the wonderful world of YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, God bless, man. That's somebody, you know, he's, he's hustling. He's working out there. He is? All right, should we take a break before we do this story? All right, look, there's two amazing stories coming up. We're going to take the break, okay? Uh, one, uh, the very controversial uh, Navy video story uh, from the USS Enterprise. Has James T. Kirk been decommissioned? We will find out. And furthermore, the Turkish, Navy, uh, Turkish uh, military, I should say, and their interesting policy on gays in the military in Turkey, you don't want to miss that story. All right, come right back.